The Value Art Podcast. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to The Value Art Podcast. I'm your host, Eddie Contento, with my lovely co-host, Izzy Godina. Is that how you say your last name? Godina. You actually Godina. have to pronounce it Godina. Yes. It means New Year. It's like kind of like Croatia, Slovenia, it means year. Are, are you Croatian? I mean, I have some mixed blood. Um, I, from my dad's part, he's from Trieste in Northern Italian. So I do have, sort of have that Slovenian, uh, Croatian blood. And then from my mom's side in the U S I actually have, um, some Indian blood. So from the Mohawk tribe. <laughs> Whoa, cool. That's Which, a really cool mix. Yeah. So like the hair you can see, I'm, I'm pretty light hair, but <laughs> my mom, she was like super, super dark. I think it's funny that we're both. Uh, well, I, I, I am. Yeah, what are your uh, I'm technically American, I guess, from the United States, but um, Italian American. But I'm, I hesitate to say that I'm Italian. It, Italian, especially being surrounded by like our whole team is actually Italian. It seems like, and yeah. my housemate is Italian from uh, Puglia, from Milano. Um, but my grandmother's from Sicily. She moved to the States when she was 11, and my grandfather's also Italian, hence the last name Contento. Um, but yeah, it's, it's weird. It, like Italian American culture is such a weird thing. Do you actually, do you experience any of it? Like you, you lived in the States, right? Yes. I lived in the States until I was around 11 years old. Um, so I actually grew in my household. There was my dad speaking Italian. I would just answer back in American. Um, in English, <laughs> I didn't in American, <laughs> exactly, American English. Um, sorry. <laughs> and then at a certain point, I also had a nanny that would speak in Spanish so at a certain point, I was mixing up Spanish and Italian. So at a certain oh, wow. point... That always fascinates me, like kids that are raised with multiple languages in the household, like which one, like how they differentiate the different languages. I was sitting at breakfast the other day with a friend of mine who's, whose kid speaks Dutch, English, and French, but like all at the same time. They, they were like moving yeah. between languages all at the same time. And I'm like, how's that kid going to understand which is which? Exactly. And I, I go from Italian, but then I switch to some r words in English. I really mix them up. Um, but yeah, I guess like coming to Italy really forced me to learn Italian. And then I ended up studying Spanish too, but in the right way. So not like mixing it up with Italian, even if it does still happen sometimes. But <laughs> you never really got to truly experience the absurdity that is Italian American culture. Right. I haven't. No. Oh, have you? It is so, it I mean, is so well, strange. Have, I, mean I grew up in it. I, and, I, and I grew up in New yeah. Jersey, which is like sort of the epicenter. Like New York, New Jersey is like really, mm -hmm. that's that's where a lot of that, I guess, radicalizes is <laughs> the best word. But it, yeah, it's, it's a strange thing. Like I, I have friends and not to like, I don't want to seem like such like so negative about it because I'm not, I'm I am actually proud of my heritage, but it is mm -hmm. strange for people that, like that I grew up with to have this Italian pride, but like have never been to Italy, don't speak a word of Italian, don't even know. really know anything about the culture or the na like the nationality. Like I think that's a strange thing. I think patriotism is a strange thing to be honest with you, but that's a different. It conversation. is. It really yeah. is. Like we could go down a a tunnel talking about that. <laughs> Yeah, maybe we shouldn't. Maybe we should. We should, we should move this back to the value art conversation. <laughs> so, let's just talk about the biggest news this week: the value art auction, yes. the, the Banksy oh auction. Oh my gosh, it was insane! I was editing last week's episode. We were talking about. We were like, "Oh, we're not really sure what to expect right now." It's currently sitting at like five Ethereum, and as I'm editing this, the the auction is ending, and things are just going up. And I was like, "Oh, whoa!" And I was like, "I can't wait to talk about this with Izzy later." Sixty. 65 ETH. <laughs> I didn't know what to expect because it was sort of like at that stage a few days after. Um, and then it was just like the last 24 hours that it was going wild, insane. And I was like checking, you know, I was like refreshing and I was like, what? Wait. <laughs> I love the Giorgio's messages in our app group where he was talking. He was like, I'm shaking. Like, I remember he called me at some point and he was like, man, like his voice was trembling. And I was like, mm -hmm. I love that. I love how, how like nobody knew what to expect. And then, it, yeah, I'm, I'm happy with how things went. And it means good things for us going forward in terms of like new doors opening, new partnerships and uh, new exciting artworks. There's that threshold, right? There's that barrier that you really have to get past in the beginning where people are like, people are sitting back like, I don't know. 
low and then then you have your your first drop and it goes well and then all of a sudden they're like yeah i was i knew the whole time now i want to let's 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 talk about collaboration it's like okay okay we see you exactly yeah no it was a rush (laughs) and it's potentially good news for us because this maybe means we have a longer runway to to learn and to do this podcast so that's cool absolutely so newsletter what's in the newsletter this week what's going on that's uh noteworthy yes so olympics have you been watching them eddie i have not i it's weird like i almost never watch the olympics like every every time it happens i get my i just watch highlights i just like catch up with friends and they give me the details i remember one winter olympics i watched with my mom and Mm -hmm. i was like so bored it's okay i haven't watched it that much either i mean except for the last races so and some swimming yeah i don't know if i was watching the swimming or the swimmers but oh, okay. <laughs> you know how <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> to be honest yeah but yes it, great news for the nft the international olympics committee sealed a deal with nway which is a platform that wanted to distribute some nfts the olympics have this tradition you know they have these pins these pins 150 years ago used to be used in order to identify the athletes, the judges, so the key players of, um, you know, the games. But after that, they actually started exchanging them also among the crowd, so among the fans. So it became a really important thing for the, thing for the fan base. And that's why the IOC was looking for a way to continue to um, keep their fan base, keep them enta- entertained, and that's when they went towards NFTs and seal the deal with anyway. So what's cool about this is that, you know, the fan base can still have their marketplace exchange pins. And then the cool thing is that they're actually going to do um, a game out of it where you can earn. So like play to earn model. And this will oh. be released. Exactly. Which is going to be interesting, especially, you know, with this trend, like we talked um, in my newsletter last week, actually, that we talked in my newsletter about Axie Infinity. Um, these are play to earn games. So that's going to be awesome. And I'm interested to see how that works turn out. And it will be released towards December, more or less for the winter games. It's pretty cool. What are your, what is your opinion? Well, I want to know if, if it's something that like a traditional pin collector is no longer going to be able to get this year because, or it's going to be harder to get because they've decided to go digital. And it sort of harkens back to our conversation last week with the Damien mm-hmm. Hirsch thing about physical versus digital. But I can't find on the website if you can still buy. Or how did you get, like, I think the pins, would you get them at the games or were they were purchased through the Olympics website? Like, wh- what is the normal way of, of uh, obtaining one of these? So That's what I, I want to know. Yes. So I haven't been at the limits. From what I read, I understood that like you would exchange them like like physically, because it would right. be exchanged like from athlete to like fan, from fan to judge. You know, Whoa. like so. Okay, let me. To. I'm gonna do a quick quick DuckDuckGo search because I'm on DuckDuckGo. <laughs> uh, <laughs> where to buy Olympic pins? Let's just see what. Duck, duck, yeah. says. And I keep coming back to classicpins.com. Like, apparently, this is the de facto source on obtaining these pins. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it looks like they're not being sold through any primary channel, but they're all secondary. Like, so if what you're saying is true, that they're handed from athlete and team member to family member and so on, that's pretty cool. That, that would mean that the, there still are physical pins because I assume the athletes are there still are. using physical pins. Yeah. Exactly. So this they is another way for, for people to get their hands on a pin that they maybe wouldn't have otherwise. Can you picture this being applied in any other sort of um, social event or gathering or something that you do take part of? Like, do you go to festivals? Do you go to... In the music industry. I would like to see it. Definitely I see the music, the music industry being, especially like live events for music, mm-hmm. being the place where NFTs provide the most disruption. I use that term lightly mm-hmm. because I don't... Like I'm in the image and heat uh, uh, ideology where it's like not doesn't have to be a disruption. It can be an augmentation mm-hmm. of the existing infrastructure. I have tickets to a Jacob Collier concert this February. I would love if if there was like uh, additional perks that came with the ticket that were on the blockchain. But I think Jacob's a little bit behind in that sense. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. you never know. Let's maybe we can yeah. text them. <laughs> I I'll just text Jacob. I'll just we're we're bros. It's, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I'm sure yeah. he'll answer. Yeah. Yeah.
I realized that last week's episode, we didn't get a book recommendation from you. At least it didn't make it into the edit. There was quite a bit of a mess finishing that. So what happened at the end of last week's episode? Can you explain what, what, why there was such an awkward sign off? Oh, that's true. My headphones died. And of course, I, I couldn't change the system. You just left me hanging. You were just like going ahead. I couldn't hear you. You couldn't hear me. So I said, you know, after a minute, he'll realize. But after a minute, you just like went on. So I was like, okay, like, I'll just keep on not. You know, like when somebody says something and you don't understand, but you just like nod in and smile mm, yes. and laugh. I'm doing I was this doing right the now. same. I was yeah. like, I'm just like. <laughs> yeah. I won't do that again to you, Eddie. Sorry. So what is your, what's your book recommendation this week? So this week's book recommendation is a book by Camila Russo, The Infinite Machine, How an Army of Crypto Hackers is Building the Next Internet with Ethereum. It starts from the beginning of the foundation, and it's simply mind-blowing and really twisted. I would also say almost kind of dramatic <laughs> at certain points. Like when I, when I read this book, like the recap for me is like success is a marathon, just because you can see how many things we've been through to build the Ethereum network. I guess the hack really, um, that was the point that really yeah. got me. Uh, just because mm -hmm. if I, you know, I, I was like, how did you not give up after that? You know, it was like devastating for them. And they they just had this vision um, and pursued. I mean, and Vitalik I think that's is like a fucking genius. That guy yes. is a, is a yes. I don't even understand. How old is he? 22, 23 or something yes. like that? Yes. And it, I, I, what does his mind run on? I don't understand. I, like he's insane. He started writing articles at the very beginning on Bitcoin. When he was like 16, 17. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and getting paid in, in crypto. Like he's a genius. <laughs> Fuck. That's, yeah. That's, I know. That's because and, he's on another wavelength, you know? And I think for him, it wasn't, it was probably never an option to stop or to, to like turn back or to give up. It was probably like, no, this is the future. Why would I, why would I not pursue it? Exactly. And, yeah. um, I, I love this book and it's a really easy read. Um, but who is who is Camilla in relation to this story? Like, does she have history in the beginning? Like, did she like house Vitalik in her garage for the foundation of it? Or like, is she just a fan of, of the technology? So she was a journalist um, for Bloomberg for around seven years. And then she became really passionate about crypto. Um, and she started, fond she founded uh, the Defiant, which is an awesome blog that I love reading for all the crypto and NFT news. Um, also, their podcast is really nice. And yeah, like she's super inspirational. Also, because there's not a lot of women at the moment in the crypto space. Why do you think there there isn't a lot of women in this space? I know that's a loaded question, but... I'm, I'm really trying to figure it out. Um, also, among my friends, I don't have any friends that are women like that invest in crypto or are also interested. I've tried many times to also get my, um, yeah, my, my friends involved. Right. Um, but they're, they're just like, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't, I don't really trust it. Uh, I'll, I'll get like, I'll inform myself, but then they don't end up doing it. Um, right. it's kind of sad for me. And I'm still, that's a very good question you asked me because I'm still trying to like find the right way to like get them on, on board. I, I definitely think we need more more women like Camila in the crypto space, but they're coming. I mean, you can see on Twitter especially. Producer Mark has a link for us, uh, worldofwomen.art, uh, a collection of unique, cool, and diverse women ready to leave a mark in the NFT space. This is something we should check out for sure on, the, on maybe another episode. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Cool. I would I would love to explore this further and with more <laughs> preparation. But that's a, yes. I, I like how I like how each episode we we have a conversation that leads to a question that could lead to an episode. So that's that's a good thing to jot down on the the big idea list that we we're starting to. Accumulate. I love that too. Yeah, like cool. definitely crypto NFTs women. Uh, we need more of that. <laughs> so I want to talk stoner cats, but I kind of want to save yeah, it. Yeah, save our... it for. Yeah, I think we should. But do you think it'll be? Awesome. Do you think it'll be too late by the time we get that conversation around to finalized, and then the whole thing? Like it would be next well, week, I think. And you can just say the cat was yeah. so stoned it take took him a while to get there. Like, <laughs> <laughs> no. True. True. 
All right. Well, we'll, we'll see. We okay. may have a special guest on the on the podcast, uh, not next week, but the following week, or maybe it'll be some sort of intermediary uh, interview that I do um, with uh, somebody related, associated indirectly with stoner cats which is the mila kunis ashton kutcher vitalik uh, voiced animated series all right so i think that's a good time to move on to our guest this week uh i'm very excited to, to have a conversation with uh peter who's a collector from just outside of copenhagen he has a company called multiples inc and he sp- specializes in collecting banksies like he's really good at, at getting his hands on banksies and he's got a few he's going to talk to us today about the story of Spike and how he came into contact with it and a little bit about the artist and the artist's work. Uh, and yeah, should be a fun conversation. So uh, I'd like to welcome Peter Viedberg onto the Value Art Podcast. Peter, thanks for uh, for joining us today. Oh, you're welcome. Cool. So um, Peter, tell us quickly who you are and uh, what you do. Well, again, I'm Peter. I'm uh... I collect art and I deal in art. I collected for 30 years almost. And then about 10 years ago, I started dealing as well, uh, mostly with uh, Banksy, Andy Warhol, and uh, Damien Hirst. What was the draw for you into collecting versus, uh, I don't know, making art or, or criticism or, or whatever? Well, the true story is money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, makes sense. I, I, I found out that um, I was good at collecting. Um, in money terms, uh, the right works, so I could profit on them. Mm-hmm. And I used to be a businessman in in the clothing industry, and um, we had a thriving business. And then came the big uh, money breakdown, uh, like what is it, thirteen years ago or something like that? Two thousand. And I, yeah, around that. And we kept it going uh, a few years, and um, I kept all my art, and I lost everything else, and. Uh, that's it. It's 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 back on the shelves now. Everything, <laughs> but but anyway, and then I thought I would I would um, not continue in the same business. So I, I I took into art business. I thought that was a walk in the park. And uh, <laughs> okay. it was not. what surprised you most? What was the if you th- you thought it was easy getting into it? What surprised you the most? Yeah, getting yeah, into it? yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I I thought it was a very intellectual, you know, uh, world. People people speaking a lot about art and emotions and, and stuff like that and politics and uh, i found out it's not it's about money and uh, at the end of the day and um, not not all dealers will say it uh, gallerists uh, might do it and museum people will, will continue saying that but it, it's a money game yeah so less art speak and more business lingo yeah yeah, yeah. I, I like the combination of, of both what drew you to banksy or what was your first encounter with banksy that you you knew like okay mm. i need to collect that uh, I think uh, I think the first work I saw actually it was a print. I think it was the Kate Moss print. He did some edition at some point with with Kate, Mo- Kate Moss instead of uh, Marilyn Monroe. Ah, and of, co- so of course, Mar- Marilyn I knew from 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 Andy Warhol. And yeah. um, then I thought, okay, it, it, it's funny, but it's it's not like a it's not like a masterpiece. It's funny, but um, and and I, I checked the name and. Um, I found out he was a street artist, or, or, or rather, first I thought he was a graffiti artist, but then I learned there's a big difference. Hmm. Um, yeah, and then um, then I started finding um, his works interesting. Was the having collected Warhol uh, what appealed to you when you saw the Kate Moss, and did that did it like aggravate you at all to see that somebody was sort of ripping off Warhol style, or was that because they're both appropriation artists? Was that like okay? <laughs> no, no, it, it's not rip. It's not rip off because uh, Andy Andy Warhol was the was was the biggest rip off of all people. <laughs> yeah. Um. And but but they are kind of um. They go they are, they go alongside uh, in some ways and in others they they totally depart because Warhol was into fame. Uh, I don't think Banksy is because we don't really know who he is and. Uh, Warhol was, you know, rubbing his shoulder with famous people. Uh, the Chelsea almost, Hotel. <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Everybody, yeah. celebrities. And he almost invented, you know, Instagram with all his Polaroids and stuff like that. Yeah. And we don't see any of that from, from Banksy uh, yeah. at all. But but still, I think they have a lot of in, in, in common. What are some of the characteristics that Banksy exhibits that make him different from other artists that uh, that you think are stand out, unique to Banksy, only Banksy? Mm. It depends on one, what you mean uh, by exhibit, because if you mean um, the original street uh, work that was done uh, yeah, in the streets or the studio works, uh, there's a big difference in my opinion, because um, 
the question is if you exhibit art in the street or if you showcase it and uh, you know people take it away and stuff like that and that's different from 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 showing in a gallery so it, it depends on if, if if you're thinking about street works or street related works or or uh, in my opinion the, the more the more um, uh, boring studio works did you did the anonymity really appeal to you I mean, I thought, and I, th I still think it's funny. Yeah, I like it. I like it. You know, he's yeah. he's the most well-known, unknown person uh, in, yeah, in the world. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think it's a brilliant. I think it's brilliant that he that it he is it is maintained it, is. it. Tell us about your organization, about uh, Multiples Inc., and how that came to be. You guys are based in Copenhagen. Uh, yeah, outside Copenhagen, fifty yep. kilometers outside of Copenhagen. It's a collective. It's it's three of you guys, right? Nope. No, it's just me. It's just you. Okay, I don't know where I read. I thought there was two other people involved. I, might, I thought oh, I read that, that on the that was, you know, at, at some point, um, I purchased the work called uh, by Banksy called Donkey Documents. Uh, ah, okay. An, an Italian filmmaker made them, Marco Prosepio, I think he, his name is. He stayed here with me for a few days. Um, and he made a movie about yeah, Donkey Documents, The Man Who Stole Banksy, I think they call it. Uh -huh. uh, and and um, that work I bought with with uh, two other dealers from from Sweden. So that's probably oh, where you got that, the that's definitely the it. Person yeah. From. yeah. Where did that fall in your? Is that earlier in in the in your collection of Banksy works? Or uh, that, was that, 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 that was quite early. I, I think I purchased that work in late two thousand and thirteen. Okay. Um, and that that was uh, the second uh, Banksy work uh, I bought. And of course, it was a street work. Did you pick that up before Spike? Yes. I did. So that that would have been the first piece that you had from that region then? That was the first uh, work from, from Palestine, yes. That was a very big rock. It was like uh, two times uh, 350 or something like that, meters. It was a nightmare because the, the weight was five tons. So it, I have some um, experience in taking rocks out of uh, Palestine. Yeah, not only, like you ha you might, must be one of like a handful of people that have ever had to do that in the world, right? Like what... What is that like having to to navigate the logistics of that? Uh, terrible, absolutely yeah. terrible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had to call the the foreign service in Denmark to 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 be, be sure that I didn't put money somewhere <laughs> where I shouldn't put money. I, I've had my part of conflict in the world, uh, you know, and I don't need any more conflict. And people have so many opinions. Normally, I don't give a I don't give a damn about that. But um, the kind of opinions I got when I when I bought the uh, Donkey documents, they were pretty massive, uh, um, and I can handle that. But uh, the, the press wrote that that uh, I had people to cut the wall, uh, which was totally untrue because it was cut in, uh, you know, it, it, when the painting was still on almost or fresh. Uh, uh, so, yes, I would I would buy a piece um, that has been off the wall for, 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 for some time, uh, but I will never buy a mural again that weighs five tons. Never again. Mm -hmm. Okay, but so do you think it's the it's the right of the neighborhood or the person who owns that building to say like I'm going to remove this and sell it, or, or it should remain there for the public that the, that passes mm -hmm. by there? Yeah, it, of course it should uh, should remain there, but but it, but it's not going to, and certainly yeah. not going going to do so now because the value is so high. So if Banksy ran around now and and put little rats out and and, and we knew it was him, they would be gone before the paint was uh, yeah. dry. And uh, the people that didn't get a street work in their hands, they will say they should stay there. The people who, who, who got course. one in hand, they love it, uh, especially if they made money from it. Uh, and you can turn back, you, you can turn back to, to Keith Haring. Uh, some of the most important works from him, in my opinion, is the subway drawings that he did. And he left them in the subway and then people liked them and they took them down. And, and, and the yeah. people who did that uh, in the 80s, uh, they are kind of like art heroes now. Uh, most of them sold them, but they but they rescued uh, some of the best work he did. Yeah, uh, and, and I'm, I'm not saying I'm a savior, but um, and, and and that's not why I'm in the business. I'm, I'm there because I like Banksy and I uh, I like money. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but but actually all the money I can mention all the money from from buying the wall went to uh, refurbishing a, a Christian church in Beit Jala, I think it's called in, in Bethlehem. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. That's really cool that you you were conscious uh in in pursuing that piece because i imagine there's already a million things going on that you're trying to validate yeah. and keep track of but yeah that's yeah, really yeah, cool yeah. so tell me a little bit about the backstory of spike because we don't have uh, a lot of information about it online we don't have a lot of information like that's like you're you are the source for us like so tell me how that tell me about the backstory of the piece itself if you can and then tell me about how you first learned about it and then how it 
yeah. sort of came into your possession. Banksy, Banksy in the old days, around 2004 and five, maybe before, he made an, an annual a treasure hunt uh, where people could uh, could follow him on his website and he would, put, he would put out some hint somewhere and then you can win a prize. And I think it was 2005 uh, when he was in Palestine, he put out Spike and as I recall, he placed it. Uh, near the wall, uh, separation wall or, or security wall, depends on, on how you see it. Um, he placed it under a, 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 a sprayed rat with a shovel, I think. And then you had to to uh, to find uh, the rat with a shovel and what was like be, uh, below it. And that was Spike. And then you had to report the name Spike to uh, Banksy in 2005 via his website. And I, as I recall... Uh, the guy who found it, I don't know his name, but uh, he received an email, or, ra- or rather he, he emailed uh, Banksy at that time, and he received a return email, which I believe is it was uh, directly from Banksy because it's, it was quite personal, you know, in the wordings. You're a fucking winner and stuff like that. Um, his assistants, they, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't write like that. So I, I think that was from, from the man himself. Wow. Imagine, imagine getting a yeah. personal email from Banksy. Yeah. <laughs> that's so that's super cool so then what was the next phase of its chain of ownership after that um the guys you mentioned before the swedish art dealers they had a small show going on in i think it was 2006 or seven or eight i can't remember oh that no 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 that was that was later that was around when we bought the wall so 13 or something like that anyway they had it uh, exhibited um i had a look at it and uh I found out that uh, I found it interesting and I bought it. And then later I found out because I didn't know at the time that, uh, that it was uh, featured in, uh, in a catalog uh, from 2007 uh, from Vanina Holosek Gallery in New York City. Uh, and I got the catalog and, and there it was on page something, uh, full page. And of course, uh, when you're going to sell a work, especially by Banksy, who refuses to authenticate anything that is street or street related, um, then it's good to have it in, a, in, a, in an early catalog. And, and there it was. And uh, I think I sold it way too cheap, but uh, that's life. Uh, everything I have sold uh, by Banksy, I could have, you know, tripled or, or fourth, uh, tripled the, um, many times, but that's life. And later, I think the work was, uh, no, before that, the work was probably part of um, uh, Pollock Fine Art. I can't remember his first name uh, from Pollock Fine Art. Then it went to Artificial Gallery in London um, and then exhibited, as, as, as I said before, with the Vanina Holosek Gallery and then the, uh, um, then in Sweden and then, then me. When you first saw it, what was your impression? Hmm. <laughs> that it was Banksy. Uh, <laughs> that it was uh, probably not the best piece of uh, of art in the world, but but uh, you know any, anything that relates to Banksy and, and and especially the early years is Banksy history and it's part of it's part of art history. Um, and of course, it, it's it's political because it, it's it's got to do with with the Palestine, and and that's why I found it um, that's why I found it interesting because nobody no 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 other artist. Um, that was known at the time and that is known now uh, really um, gets into uh, conflicts uh, like Banksy does. So I, I found it interesting. But, you know, uh, uh, my wife certainly did not want a piece of rock in, in, in her living room. So uh, <laughs> it had to go. Not even a Banksy. We, I have many Banksys. You should see my walls here. So. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> wow. Street art really is the only type of art that you can make this the statements that he's making especially related to conflict you know being there putting the work at the heart of everything it's really the only type of of art that you can make that kind of impact it's really really crazy really wonderful Uh, you you think so i think every artist i think every artist can do it but they don't but 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 of course it's easier for for banksy because he or at least in the old days he, he he put it in the street without asking for permission uh, if you ask permission now, uh, as an artist in, in many galleries, they will say no, don't get, don't go there, don't touch it. Uh, 
will just get you know in conflict and we have a rich american bias they don't like that 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 so um, true he, yeah. he can do what he wants he's, he's free in that context yeah do you think his anonymity uh if it were to, if he were to be revealed would impact the value of his work no i don't i, I don't think it would matter and uh, he will never he will never get revealed he, he will never come out himself and uh all the stories you know you, you you can find on the internet it's it's a very clever setup from, from the early days um we all have some names and we have some photos and yeah. uh, you know yeah. every toddler can google it but yeah. it, but it's not it's not like that i found out after 10 years it's it's uh it's not like that at all are you aware following um uh, up on the nft news in the digital art world and that and that new those new developments absolutely not no, not interesting to you. No, not at all. The reason I ask is because I have I am I'm curious about uh, your opinion of uh, and you, I'm sure you can still speak on this uh, of mm, fan, yeah. fandom fandom versus connoisseurship because I feel mm. like NFTs and are are allowing fans to sort of decide what what the value of the of the work is and um and it's it's becoming less about a, sort of a gatekeeper like connoisseur deciding of the value of a piece because the fans can really buy directly from artists now and, and mm. kind of cut out the middleman. And I'm curious if you've encountered that or if you've seen that impact the way you invest or, or some of the pieces you're interested in. I notice you, you have some, some cause stuff, right? Yeah, but no, no, no more. I sold it, but, but I used to have some cause, yes. Yeah, and I feel like cause is a good example of, uh, a, of a really accessible commercial more of a mm. merchandiser than an artist, in my opinion, but um, it, it allows yeah, fandom to really dictate demand. Yeah, um, uh, yes, I think you're right. It is, I think it's a question of making uh, multiples uh, the way cause do it, and and I think it was uh, Joseph Boy saying that, that the idea of multiples is is the distribution of ideas, and uh, of course you do it like that. But do you distribute an idea if you make an NFT? I saw that uh, Damien Hurst uh, made like I think it was. 4,000 small uh, spot paintings, uh, probably made by a machine. Uh, they were all, they were all, I think they were all unique, yeah. uh, or at least by assistance, he's not going to make 4,000 himself. Um, but what is unclear to me is that if people get the physical artwork, or if they just get a, a I don't know the word, crypto line uh, on their iPhone, what, what, what do people get? Do you know? Yeah. I mean, it's it's a a certificate essentially. It's a it's a hash of a, a string of characters mm -hmm. that verifies that you are the unique owner of this. And uh, I I think it sort of parallels a, a COA in the art world. I mean, in the same way that you can have millions of prints of of the girl with pearl earring, but you know, there's only one of those, yeah. right? You can't hang it on the wall. That's very true. And, and I think that's uh, I think that's unsexy. But, but then again, I'm 55. I, it's, it's probably new, the, the new way of dealing. I, I understand that, but I, I think I'm too old to getting into it. But I don't, I don't, I, uh, yeah. I don't think it, I honestly don't think that's an age thing. And that's why I love that Damien Hurst piece, because it is a, a question of like, do you value the physical thing or just the idea of the physical thing? And that that's a conversation we're going to keep having. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's really but, cool. But, and but, but Hurst, Hurst actually made 4000 pieces. Yeah, and you and I think you could choose if you want. I think you paid four thousand dollars for for one, and you could choose if you wanted. Uh, it's probably called the token, or if you wanted uh, the actual piece. Yeah, and and one, you can only have one or the other, and the other is destroyed based on your choice. Ah, okay, got it. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's it's quite a statement to make around this conversation. I thought I thought it was brilliant. Yeah, Izzy, Mark, did you have anything you wanted to to ask? Uh, Hi, Peter. It's Mark, co-producer. I'm intrigued about how you think about the progression of Banks' work over the years. How has his art evolved? Do you think he's got better or worse? Or do you think Banks is unique in that his work has largely remained the same over the years? It's a very good question. I, I think I think Banksy is, is brilliant, uh, but I think he was more brilliant maybe five or 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Um, the guy is, you know, like 50 years old now. He, he can't run around, you know, spraying on people's walls anymore. When he does, I believe he does it uh, with permission from, from people. He did a prison not so long ago. I can't remember the name. And, of course, it's, it's, uh, it's commissioned. Um, um, I yeah, can't hear yeah. you. I don't know. Uh, you're you talking about the, the prison where the guys were pelling down into the typewriter. Yeah. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. When when he does stuff like that now, of course, it's it's kind of street work. But I, I, he has permission to do it. I, I know that. Uh, and he didn't have permission in, in the old days. So of course he has changed. Um, and, uh, and 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 the money is also a big game changer because there's a lot of the street art community and uh, especially the graffiti uh, community. They dislike uh, Banksy. Actually, they, they did 15 or 20 years ago already. Um, but 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 uh, it doesn't mean that that uh, uh, that the new stuff he's making is is, is not as it's not as good. But it, but it it's it's not the same in my opinion. When you take this when you take the studio works. No, let let me start some something somewhere else. Uh, what I did with my own inventory in, in Banksy, I used to have works um, that was from pest control. You know, uh, not prints. They never interested me. But but originals. Um, and I, I sold those work and I, I spent the money on. Uh, on street works and street related works because I could get them cheaper, much cheaper even, and they are better, much better in my opinion. And I think in the long run, uh, the legacy of Banksy will be the works that was done in the street, uh, done in his early studio. Um, and we even, ha- we even have that from the artist himself. I found some letters uh, not so long ago when I was doing some research where Banksy was saying, uh, the works I make in the studio, they are just souvenirs, souvenirs for rich people. The, re- the real works, they are done in the street. Um, so that's that's the artist's opinion. Do you think I that totally those works that him. he's being getting permission to do now, you feel like they're cheapened now? No, I think they, I think they, they are works uh, that are good to promote Banksy and to promote their message. Uh, and, you know, the newspapers, they love it. Um, when you Google Banksy, they're much more hit than any other artists. I think he has 10 or 100 times more hits than Damien Hirst, who is the highest profiting of, of, of the artist, uh, for this time being anyway. But um, I think, I, in my opinion, uh, the best Banksy works, they are they are from, from 2010 and, and backwards. Not saying that the, the, the last 10 years are... Are bad works. They are not just the same because um, because he has to leave the street. He has to to be more commercial, uh, and it's and then, and and he has his website, you know, with pest control uh, saying uh, you can't buy anything. Nothing nothing is available. Um, so so many of the works they are hard. They are hard. Uh, the the accessibility to them is difficult because you can't buy the stuff in a gallery. Right. Um, so I think it, it's a, it's a it's a typical Banksy game. See see my stuff, see my name, see what I do, and it's brilliant. And you can't buy anything, so you have to turn to the secondary market to get to get yeah. the stuff. And and on the secondary market, we have street works, and we have prints, and we have originals. I'm curious what the type of clientele on the secondary market for Banksy is like. Like, what kind of people are you in, are you running into? Uh, rich Americans, uh, rich Italians, uh, rich. Uh, People from Switzerland, um, uh, even had, had a guy from, from Germany whose wife wanted a, a, a small summer house or something like that. He didn't want that. He wanted the street work uh, and he bought it uh, and he paid a lot of money for it. It was an early one, fully documented and stuff like that. Um, and and uh, I know now that it's, it's at least five times uh, worth of what he paid like in, in 2015. <laughs> so he's a happy guy. So he's like to his wife, like I told you so. He he made the right exactly, choice. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. But what are those interactions like for you? Are they like do you share do you share a comment? Like is the conversation rich or is it like a really brief exchange? Like how does that how does that work for you? Very often it's just uh, it's just via email. Uh, I try to to source out uh, works where where the, where the provenance is solid uh, and from people I know. I was happy to be with. Uh, with uh, some of Banksy's uh, old friends early on, uh, I, I won't mention names here, but you can find some on, on, on my website, uh, who worked with Banksy uh, in, in the early days, and some of them still see him. And uh, there's some of them, you, you're not going to believe what they have. It's yeah. uh, it's wonderful. But but they are scared of selling it because Banksy refuses to, to authenticate the works, right. uh, which is not necessarily, or it's, it's actually not a, a question of... Uh, of uh, authenticity it's more uh, a question of not wanting to add value to the works because either a work is authentic or it's not have you found yourself sort of in the position like people reaching out to you to be like hey do you think this is authentic as like yeah a, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah yeah have you to have you embraced that position that that like expert uh uh no. the, the, the decider 
I don't I don't sell anything I don't trust uh, 100%. Mm-hmm. But still I know I'm not going to get the accept from 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 the artist or his uh, affiliates. Right. Uh, and then I know there is and everybody knows there is so much crap out there. You're not yeah. going to believe it. Uh but it it's uh, if you're a seasoned collector you, you know how to you know what to look for and um, what's the backstory? Can you prove it? Uh, what's the provenance? Do you have any early photos? Stuff like that. Yeah, documentation becomes a really important part yes, of doing it, that. Yes, it does, and that's that's also what I what I what I told you about Spike. It was in the, in, in the early catalog, two thousand and seven, and 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 the work is from two thousand and five, and nobody nobody put uh, names on rocks uh, two years after, and uh, in two thousand and seven, I called it a Banksy. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Cool. Um, I'm. I do have one question that's kind of unrelated to any of that, and it's a, more just a fun thing that I thought I'd ask you about. I I watched um, Exit Through the Gift Shop again recently, like I think a year ago, um, and it it occurred to me that maybe the whole thing, and I'm maybe this is obvious, but that the whole thing was coordinated by Banksy, and that Mr. Brainwash and Terry are just a character he designed, but the duration, or the amount of footage they had, is the reason that I'm like, oh, maybe not, because. I think Shepard Fairey looks really young in the beginning of that documentary, and mm, th- then much yeah. older. And I'm curious what you what your uh, thoughts on that are. If that's it, 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 Mr. Brain was, uh, of course, it's shit art, uh, <laughs> and that's all. And that's okay. Uh, I think graphically it, it looks funny on on the wall, but but it, it is crap, and he knows it himself. Um, <laughs> some galleries are not not um, liking me now. I don't care, but. Um, I think it. I think it was all a, a Banksy prank, uh, and he made that with uh, what's the guy called Thierry Guetta, Thierry Mr. Guetta, Brainwash. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I, yeah, and, and when and when and when you look behind the scenes, uh, who produced the movie, you will find out it, that it was uh, Banksy's business manager. I can't remember her name right now. Holly, 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 something. Holly Cushing, or Cushing, or something like that. Mm-hmm. She was the producer. Uh, so, so of course it's. Um, it was meant to be a, a work by uh, by Banksy, by Banksy. And, and, yeah. and not a and not a movie by Mr. Brainwash. Right. It's just it's so layered and nuanced that you you could believe that Terry was making the statement by being the shit artist that he is. You know, it, it mm-hmm. it's plausible. I think it's I think it's brilliant. And and because if it is a Banksy like uh, elaborate hoax, then that's even more brilliant. I think the the film itself is one of a kind. I really really enjoy I think, it. I think I think Banks is testing the art market. What can we yeah. actually sell to people? What are they willing to pay for? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I, I guess also with the shredding, the, the, the painting that shredded itself at, was it Christie's or Sotheby's? Uh, Sotheby's, yes. Yeah, yeah. There you, should, there, you, there you should also look for the provenance of the work, but you can do that yourself. Yeah. Well, uh, Peter, I think that's everything I wanted to, to talk about, and I'm, thank you for stopping by the podcast and talking to us. And um, You're welcome. I'll, I'm going to be continuing to follow along with your uh, your collecting endeavors. Yes, do that. Thank you. Thank you for calling. Cool, Take care. Peter. Bye-bye. Ciao, Bye. man. Thank Take you. care. Bye. Bye. Okay, so that was a... I keep... I say I say so, so often. So, so, <laughs> so often. often. So, so often. <laughs> that was a nice, uh, nice little conversation. It was quick. I really appreciate how, like, direct and to the point he is with his answers. I, I'm not going to have to do too much editing on that interview, so that's great um <laughs> I, I can't imagine because he he was hinting a little bit in that conversation about like the people the friends of banksy and the stuff they have of banksy's work and i can only imagine what those things are and i'll probably never know or never be I even think close we're never to knowing know. yeah we're, it's we're just not in my <laughs> it's, it's not in the cards for me yeah yeah but that was fun i'm glad we did that and um how are things going in the on the the forums on the you know the, on Reddit and on uh, Twitter and I don't know what this is this doesn't represent anything. Oh, it's what, exploding. How are things going? Yeah. We got a very nice comment. Let me get it. Oh, okay. Let me hear yes. it. Yes. Wait, I have to find it. <laughs> this will be, this will be good. We can make this a regular thing. We can make the uh, the segment at the end of the show where you read embarrassing, cringeworthy exactly. comments to Eddie and surprise him. <laughs> exactly. So to last week's podcast, we had Space Alien say, great podcast. Virtual real estate is one of a thousands of things NFTs and blockchain mesh will bring to the global economy in the next few years. True that. And I'm definitely looking forward to making that episode if we can get (laughs) Mark to be on here with proper audio at some point uh, to talk about virtual real estate, the central land, possibly. 
uh, realm. Realm is happening, I think, next week. So more on that awesome. at a later time. All right. Um, let's let's wrap it up there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Cool. All right, guys. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you again next week. Ciao. See you. Ciao. Ciao for now. Uh, proper sign off. Yeah, <laughs> I'm glad we did it. We finally did it. All right. Goodbye. Yes. <laughs>